Somebody say amen. Is anybody ready to change your residence from the wilderness to the promised land this morning? We're going to start today a brand new sermon series that God has put on my heart, I believe, for our church and, and probably for some of you specifically. And we're talking about the glory days, living our promised land life right here and right now. Can you say amen? Glory days. Now, some of us probably hear that, that phrase and we, and we ask the question, Pastor, have you seen my checkbook? Glory days. Do, do you know... The struggles that I endure day in and day out in life. Do you have any idea of the issues that I face every day when I get up and go to work? How many know life knocks us down sometimes? And I want you to know the devil is intent on keeping you down. But what if I told you that God has a better way of life for you? What if I told you that God has, has positioned you in such a place that these days you're living in right now can be your best days, that these days can be your glory days? You know what Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4 says? It says, rejoice in the Lord. Somebody say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Not just sometimes, not just when things are going good, not just when, when you're on the mountain, but rejoice, to, to celebrate, to be joyful. Rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul said, and again I say, rejoice. Can I tell you, when, when Jesus becomes the center of it all, when Jesus becomes the reason you get out of bed in the morning, when Jesus becomes the reason that you have integrity on your job and you can put up with a, with a boss man that's making things difficult and not open up your mouth. When Jesus becomes the reason you can lift your hands and praise him regardless of the circumstance and the trial that you're going through. When Jesus becomes the reason you can lay your head down on your pillow at night in peace. When Jesus becomes the center of your life, how many know Jesus will make your life worth living and he will give you a reason to rejoice when you thought you had no reason to be joyful and to celebrate. I believe that's why the songwriter penned those words. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I want to tell somebody today, because he lives, these days can be. These days will be. These days are meant to be your glory days. Hallelujah. I believe that's God's plan for us. More specifically, I believe that's God's plan for you, for each and every one of you, those of us that are the children of God. And over these next six weeks or so, we're going to be taking a specific look at Joshua. Many of us know the, the story of, of the, the children of Israel. They're in Egyptian bondage for 400 years, led out by a man named Moses. They get right on the brink of the promised land, man, the land God has told them man, way back all the way to Abraham, this land is yours and where you put your feet, it's going to belong to you. And, and because of some disbelief, because of some distrust and lack of faith, they ended up wandering around in a place called the wilderness for 40 years. Finally, God raised up a new leader, a man by the name of Joshua. He said, Joshua, you're going to take my people into the promised land, into this place of promised life. It was a land of prosperity and abundance. This, their promised land was a place of peace and rest. It was a position that they were living in of victory and triumph. And I believe that God wants to do the same thing for you and I today. How many know we have a Joshua today and his name is Jesus? Matter of fact, the name Jesus is a derivative of the name Joshua. Jesus is our Joshua. And he wants to lead us into that promised land. He wants to lead us into that promised life. He wants for you and I to leave behind days that have been filled with despair. Days that have been filled with defeat. And he wants us to embrace days that are filled with joy and success. But how many of you know the devil is a master manipulator? The devil wants you to believe that the wilderness is as good as it gets. The, the devil wants you to believe, as he did with the children of Israel, that you should have just stayed in Egypt. You were in bondage, but at least you had food on your plate, right? He wants you to believe you should have stayed there, or the wilderness is maybe just as good as it gets. He, he wants you to forget 
about the potential of the promised land. Because you know what the devil fears? He fears the day that you and I ever get the vision for everything that God has created us to be. He fears the day that you get the vision for everything God has created you to do, for the plans and purposes that he has in your life. And when you walk into that promised land, you will accomplish everything God has meant for you to accomplish. You will be who God has called you to be. That is the plan and the purpose of the, from the Lord for you, my friend. But the devil wants to keep you from realizing that place this morning. But I want you to know something today. The devil is a liar. Look at your neighbor and tell him, he said the devil's a liar. He's a liar. These days are glory days. Somebody say that. These days are glory days. For the next six weeks, we're going to have a little motto. Every, every Sunday morning, man, we're going to say this. I want you to get this in your spirit because I want you to believe this at the core of who, you, of who you are. Thank you to Reverend Robin Angler gave me this beautiful poster. We got it on the screen for you as well. I'll just read it for you today, but next Sunday I want you to be able to say it. These days are glory days. My past is past and my future is bright. God's promises are true and his word is is sure. Do you believe that today? With God by my side, listen to this, I will be all he wants me to be. I will do all he wants me to do, and I will receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. If you receive that, would you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Think about the children of Israel. Moses is their leader. He has been. They've seen God do miraculous things through Moses. But then Moses, because of an issue he had where he he struck a rock instead of speaking to the rock, he got up angry in the wilderness. God told Moses, you're not going to walk into the promised land. You'll see it with your eyes, but your feet will not touch it. Moses climbs up on a mountain. He sees the promised land. He he sees everything that God has destined for the children of Israel. But there he dies. And how many of you know when he died, it would have been easy for the children of Israel to have wallowed in the misery. It would have been easy for them to have sat down and and, and sat in their grief and their sackcloth and their ashes and, and believed that when Moses was buried, so were the hopes and dreams of a promised land life. But I like the way Joshua chapter 1 begins. Joshua chapter 1 verse number 1 says this. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua Son of Nun, Moses' assistant. And he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come. A- another version said, Therefore, arise. The time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I heard Tim Walker say during our spring revival this past May, he said he believed that the greatest treasures on earth were not found in the gold mines of Indonesia. They're not found in the diamond mines of South Africa. But they're found in the graves of men and women whose hopes and dreams were buried with them. I wonder how many of us here today, the devil has tried to tell you That because of your past, because of the issues maybe behind you, that all the hopes and the dreams that God has aspired for you, all the plans and purposes that God has for you, they're gone. And and they can never come to fruition. They'll never come to pass in your life. I believe that prophetically God is speaking to the church, not just this church, but to the church at large. And he's declaring the same thing that he said to Joshua. Therefore, arise. The past is the past. You need to let some things 
things go. But the time has come for the church to walk into a new season. The time has come for you to walk in and lay claim to your glory days. The time has come for us to hold fast to every promise that God has given us and lay claim to every square inch of the promised land that God has said is ours. Therefore, God said, the time has come. Arise and be who God has called you to be. Claim what God has said is yours. Then God's called Joshua. He spoke to Joshua. The time has come. Joshua began to lead the children of Israel, and miraculous things began to happen. They, they watched Moses part the Red Sea. But how about Joshua? He walks up to the Jordan River. The rivers, man, they separate. They walk over on dry land into the promised land that God said was theirs. The first city they come to, we're going to talk about this as we go along, is Jericho, this great fortified city. And all they did was march around a few times and praise God and blast some trumpets, and the walls of that fortified city fell down. The Bible actually said there was a time when, when Joshua and the children of Israel were fighting against their enemies that the sun stood still in the sky. Have you read that? The moon refused to come out for about a day just to make sure they had enough daylight where they could see the enemy that they were going to destroy. God was moving for them. God was fighting for them. And how many of you know if God is for us, tell me who on earth can be against us? He's with them and for them, and he's with you and for you today. Every king of Canaan was defeated until the children of Israel walked in and they claimed every bit of the property that God said was theirs. I believe there's some property that our enemy that belongs to us and our enemy standing on it this morning. And I believe it's about fair time we walk in and we lay claim to what God said is ours. We take back what the enemy is trying to withhold from us. The promised land for Israel was a place where they were accomplishing everything God meant for them to accomplish. They were realizing their full potential as children of God. And for us, that's exactly what the promised land is for you and I this morning. It's a place where we become everything God is destined for us to become. Where we accomplish everything that God has purposed for us to accomplish. Where we are who God says we are. We do what God commands us to do. Our promised land, it, it isn't necessarily a, a physical reality, but it's a spiritual one. I like what Max Licato said. It isn't real estate, but it's a real state of the heart and mind. Because it's a place where we realize, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's a life where we realize, I am more than a conqueror through Christ who has loved me. It's a place where we realize that his power is made perfect in our weaknesses. It's a life where we do not lose heart, where we are joyful in our tribulations, where we are anxious for nothing, where we are praying about everything, and where we are doing all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I was reminded of that old song that says there will be no sorrow there and that tomorrow. We're going to be there by and by. There's milk and honey flowing. How many would say that is where I'm going? Canaan land is just inside. Praise God. Praise God. But you know there's a few things that happen when we make up our mind that we're going to leave the wilderness and walk into the promised land. The first is this. We move from anticipation to acceptance. Now what's the difference? To anticipate means we are expecting something. To, to anticipate means we are looking forward to something in the future to come. And as Christians, how many know we do a lot of that? Not anything necessarily wrong with it, but we are always kind of thinking about eternity. It'll get better 
one of these days when we all get to heaven, you know, we'll understand it better by and by when, when we all get to heaven. All my tribulation, I'll be able to enjoy a, a peaceful, a, a, a glorious, a blessed life when I get to heaven. But can I tell you something today? I don't think you have to wait to heaven to have a promised land life. We, we even hear that song that I just quoted, Canaan Land. And most of us, myself included, before I started doing some studying, we automatically assume that Canaan land must be a metaphor for heaven. But I, I want to present something to you today. Are we sure that Canaan land is talking about heaven? Because Canaan land had enemies that had to be overthrown. But will heaven? Canaan had battles that had to be fought. But will heaven? Canaan land had struggles that had to be overcome, but will heaven? See, I don't believe that Canaan land represents the life that's to come. I believe that Canaan land is the life that you can have right here, right now on this earth. I believe God wants to bless you and that these days can be your glory days. We just have to stop anticipating it and accept it. What God has said is mine. Let me give you some scripture. John 10, 10. The Bible says the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But then Jesus said these words, I have come that they may have life. The word life there, the implication is actually twofold. It has a double meaning. The Greek word is zoe. And it's re uh, translated here as the word life, but it means both eternal life, so the life that is yet to come, but it also means our natural life. Strong's Concordance described that word zoe as the principle of life that is the common possession of all men by nature upon the earth. In other words, Jesus came so that we can have life, and not just life, but the life that God has planned for us to have. The, the word actually means the God kind of life. He, he's come that we may have that God kind of life, not just in heaven, but right here on the earth. During our everyday walking, talking, working, sleeping, parents, kids, friends, and family life. I don't think it's God's will for his children to live on this earth downtrodden. I don't think it's God's will for his children to walk around depressed. I don't think it's God's will for his his children to walk around defeated. I don't think it's God's will for his children to walk around disheartened. And I don't think you have to walk, wait till heaven to have that abundant kind of life. I believe that Jesus came so that these days can be filled with the God kind of life that he has promised you and his purpose for you to have right here on earth. These days can be your glory days. We just have to move from anticipating it to accepting it. God came, Jesus came that we may have life here on this earth. Abundant life, the scripture said. Not only do you move from anticipation to acceptance, but you also move from the routine to the remarkable. Somebody say remarkable. From routine to remarkable. You, you move, in other words, from the usual to the unusual. You move from the ordinary to the extraordinary. This journey that the children of Israel were on, coming out of Egypt into their promised land, it was a journey of about 240 miles. It should have taken them... About two weeks. But how long did it take them? Forty years. They walked around for 40 years in circles. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse number 5 says, During the 40 years that the Israelites were in the wilderness, their clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on their feet. Exodus 16.35 says the Israelites ate manna for the entire 40 years. God let this little seedy bread 
fall out of heaven, and they ate it every day for 40 years until their feet reached the border of Canaan. Now, most folks read those scriptures, as I have as well, and they think, praise God for his provision. Praise God that he took care of them and fed them and their clothes never wore out and they had manna from heaven. But I read those scriptures. You know what also I I read into that? They lived for 40 years on repeat. They lived four decades doing the same old thing day in and day out. The same clothes, the same shoes, the same food. They passed by, I'm sure, the same mountain every day. And they wondered, when is this ever going to be different? Talk about being stuck in a rut. Have you ever felt like your life was just kind of stalled out? Man, that's where the children of Israel were. Talk about monotonous. Can I tell you, if you fed me crab legs on the anthem of the seas in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle, after 40 years, it's still going to get old. But I wonder how many of us would describe our Christian life that way. Same old church services. Same old relationship with God. Same old experience. The truth is about 89% would. Because Christians were interviewed from a thousand different churches. And only 11% of those Christians said they felt like they were experiencing their glory days. That means 9 out of 10 Christians are just going through the motions. We're just existing. We're stuck somewhere between Egypt and the promised land. We're not bound, but we aren't exactly free. We're, We're saved But we aren't empowered. We're living, but we aren't really living the life that God has planned for us. You know what I believe? I believe it's time for the church at large to come alive with a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's time for Christians to be empowered by the Holy Spirit that they might be everything that God has created them to be and do everything that God has called them to do. I believe what we do not need is the same old three songs and the same old three-point messages that we're so accustomed to, but what we need is the breath of God to breathe on the church. What we need is the fire of the Holy Ghost to freshen us, to revive us again, O Lord, that your people may rejoice in you. You know what the prophet said? Isaiah 43, verse 19. The Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, said, I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it, declares the Lord. I will make a pathway through the wilderness, and I will create rivers in the thirsty land. I come by, I believe, on assignment from God today to tell somebody that you might be in the wilderness. You might be in one of the darkest, bleakest moments of your life, but I believe God is speaking to you that he's about to do something new. This is time for a new season. It's time for a fresh touch. It's time for revival to be ignited in your heart and God is going to cause those rivers to flow in your dry and thirsty land. God is going to create a pathway out of the wilderness so that you can walk boldly into the promised land that God has said is yours in Jesus' name. Move from the routine to the remarkable. We move from just anticipating to accepting. Finally, I'm closing with this. When we decide to leave the promised land and walk in, or leave the wilderness rather than walk into the promised land, here's the last thing that happens in our life. We transition from being overcome to being 
an overcomer. Can somebody say praise the Lord? 400 years, the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage. They left bondage in Egypt, followed by 40 years in the wilderness. They went from being oppressed by Pharaoh to being oppressed by fear. The spies, those 12 spies that were sent out of the camp, they were standing on the threshold of God's promise. But they came back to the camp. Moses said, how was it, guys? What do you think? They said, have you seen those people? You, you think that land is ours? Those people are huge. They're, they're descendants of the Nephilim, these Anakites. They're gigantic. There's no way. You and all God's army, there's no way we can go in and run those people out. God may have said it's ours, but you better not bank on it. We can't walk in and claim that land. And because of that, the next 40 years they wandered around in a place called the wilderness. The Bible said until an entire generation of people had died. And finally he rose up some new leaders. Some fresh blood. Other than Joshua and Caleb. All brand new people. And they were tired. Of walking around in the wilderness. They were tired of doing the same old thing day in and day out. They knew, hey, we got a promise from the Lord. Have you read what they what was written down? Have you read what God spoke to our father Abraham? That everywhere we put our feet, it shall be ours. I think it's time we rise up. Therefore, the time has come. We need to leave this wilderness land behind and walk into the promised land that God said is ours. Rose up some new leaders, tired of living in the wilderness, ready to lay claim to what God said was theirs. Now I wonder how many people are here this morning that might be in that same frame of mind. That you're tired of living in the wilderness. You're tired of living a defeated Christian life. Can I tell you, the children of Israel, they were already overcome in their mind before the battle ever got started. They saw these giants, man, they saw what stood in their way, and they were already overcome in their mind. There's no way we can have what God has said is ours. How many of us are the same, man? God puts these hopes and dreams, visions before us, promises of a, of a life, man, where we're blessed in the city, blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. God's got plans and purposes and a hope and a future for us. Man, this is the promised land life where I'm being everything God's made me to be. and I'm doing all the things he's called me to do, but yet we see the giants in our way and the devil starts to speak into our mind, there's no way. It's not possible for you to live that promised land life. But I believe God's raising up some Christians today. Some people with a hunger and a thirst and a desire to walk out of the wilderness land and walk into the promised land life. Can I remind you of what 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 says? We are pressed on every side by trouble. Can anybody agree with that? Man, we're pressed on every side, it seems, by trouble. Paul's being real. He says, but we are not crushed. He said, we are perplexed. But we are not driven to despair. He said we are hunted down, but we are not abandoned by God. And he said, and we get knocked down, but we are never destroyed. How do you know we can move from being overcome to being an overcomer? Revelation chapter 12 verse number 11 gives us the blueprint. It said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. 
Can I tell you, sometimes you got to change your vocabulary. You got to start, you got to stop walking around talking about how you're defeated. And you got to start walking around talking about how you're more than a conqueror in God who has loved you. You got to start talking. I can do all things through God who gives me strength. It's the word of your testimony that makes you an overcomer. Then it says, who is it that overcomes the world? In 1 John 5, 5, only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Can I tell you, in and of ourself, we can't. In and of ourself, we won't. But in Him, we are overcomers. In Him, you already have the victory. In Him, you already have the promise of a promised land life waiting on you right here and now. We just have to move from anticipating to accepting. We got a desire to move from the routine to the remarkable. We got to believe that we are not overcome. But we are overcomers. These days for you, my friend, they can be, they will be, they are meant to be your glory days. Would you stand to your feet this morning all over this house? If you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. I want to... I want to ask a couple of questions this morning for this altar call as I prayed. About how to, to approach the church with what I believe God is wanting to speak to us. And the first is this. The only time that you're going to walk into your promised land is if you're following the right leader. you got to have your eyes on Joshua. And his name is Jesus. Scripture I quoted said it's in him that we have victory. It's in him that we are overcomers. It's, it's only believing, it's only in believing the faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I wonder, I'm sure there are maybe folks here this morning that would say, Pastor, I, I, my heart is not right with the Lord. And I know there, there's some issues, there's some stuff, there's some baggage, that some things I need to get under the blood and I need, I need to repent of and ask forgiveness for today. I want to make sure that my faith is steadfast, that this is more than a religion. This is not about coming to church on Sunday morning, folks. This is about having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an everyday life. Are you saved today? Or are you following the right leaders? Your eyes on Jesus. Is your faith in the Son of God? If not, man, I believe God wants to do a, a work in your heart today. Nobody looking around. Nobody's going to embarrass you. I'm just asking you to answer the call. If the Lord's speaking to you, you say, Pastor, that's me. I, I need to pray a prayer today and rededicate my life to the Lord. Maybe for the first time, maybe it's a rededication. Would you just slip your hand up? God bless you. I already see a hand. God bless you, dear. God bless you. I see a hand there. Anybody else? There's two. Anybody else? God bless you. I see your hand in the back, dear. God bless you. Anybody else? There's three. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, that's me, man. I got to get this right. If I want to walk in and be what God's called me to be, if I want to lay claim to my promised land, live my glory days, i got to make sure my eyes are on Jesus. My faith is in the Son of God. Anybody else? I've seen three hands. Anybody else? God bless you. I see that one. It's four. Anybody else? Could we all just pray this prayer together? Would you say, Dear Jesus? Come on, say it out loud. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And it is sin that separates me from you. This morning, I want to get my eyes on my leader. I'm bound to put my faith in the Son of God. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I'm asking you to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I accept you as my Lord. I confess you as my Savior. From this day forward, my eyes are on the prize. I will walk into my promised land. Be who you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you just lift your hands all over this sanctuary this morning? Lord, I decree in the name of Jesus over this congregation 
that our best days are yet to come. That, Lord, we as a church, we as individuals, God, we will walk into our promised land. That, God, we'll be everything you've called us to be. We'll do everything you've called us to do. Lord, I decree in the Spirit, God, that every prophecy that's been spoken about the Fairlawn Church of God, that it would come to pass in the name of Jesus. That every hindrance, every barrier would be broken, every obstacle would be removed. And that, God, we would walk into our future, into our glory days, that our best days are yet to come. That you would use us, I pray, as a beacon of hope, as a light to the New River Valley in the name of Jesus. Every member, every friend, God, every marriage, every family, I decree they're blessed in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you would take us by the hand, that you would lead us into that promised land that you said is ours. We would leave behind these wilderness days. We'd leave behind days of despair and defeat. That, God, we'd walk boldly into that promised land and we'd see every Jericho crumble. And that, God, we would lay claim to every promise that you said is ours. Lord, I speak blessings over these families. I speak blessings over this great church. We love you today. We thank you, Lord, that you have a plans to give us a hope and a future. We honor you and worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.